Hello everybody, my name is V the Victim, and today I'll be bringing you a comprehensive beginner's guide to the Theater of Blood, aka Raids 2. The Theater of Blood is a highly rewarding piece of endgame content. Teams of 3-5 to five players can battle their way through the theater's linear progression of 6 boss challenge rooms for a chance at finding unique weapons and armor in the treasure room at the end. The theater is chock full of new mechanics and unique boss battles. Only skilled, high-level players can advance all the way through to reap the great rewards that lie within. Let's get started. First, let's go over some stat requirements for the Theater of Blood. I recommend at least 90 in all melee stats, plus 90 ranged. Players attempting the theater should also have a minimum of 94 magic with Ice Barrage, and I do recommend 95 because there's some stat drain mechanics inside that will prevent you from ice barraging if your magic gets drained and you're only level 94. I also highly recommend 77 prayer for rigor and augury. Again, these aren't absolutely necessary, but both prayers will prove extremely helpful during the boss battles. 70 prayer plus piety, on the other hand, is a requirement and I would not go to the theater without it. Next, we'll look at gear setups for the theater. The general theme is to bring the best tribrid gear you can afford, with an emphasis on melee and ranged because those will be the combat styles you use most. Gear for the theater can vary wildly in price, from over 6 bill for full on max gear, all the way down to around 50 mil or even less for those with smaller banks. We'll look at a couple of setups for each price point so you can find the one that fits what you can afford best. Also, it's worth noting that as you get more experienced, you will likely want to bring more switches. For example, I always bring a Pagasian boot switch for that extra range bonus. The gear and inventory setups in this video put an emphasis on keeping switches simple and allowing you to carry as many supplies as possible while you learn. First, we have the absolute max setup. Both the max and the void setups here will run you almost 6 bill as of the creation date of this video. This is mostly due to the Scythe of Vitur, which costs over 4 bill, and the Twisted Bow, which costs over 1.2 bill. You'll notice I don't even have a real Scythe in this video because it's so expensive. I'm just using the Halloween Event Scythe as a stand-in. I'm not going to get too much into the other individual items you need to bring because they're all pictured here. If you just copy this setup, you should be in good shape. And just one quick note, with the Scythe and Dragon Claws, you do not need a Tentacle Whip. Scythe setups are the only setups where this is the case, because the scythe is your main melee weapon, and when you need a quick one, you can use the dragon claws. Next, we have the standard gear with the twisted bow. Although it still costs quite a bit, this setup should be a lot more accessible for most PVMers at around 2 bill for the whole thing. I also call it standard gear instead of expensive gear or something, because this is a setup I use, barring just a couple of extra switches. Here, we have a substantially cheaper setup. With the Twisted Bow removed from the previous more expensive setup, you can get everything for just about 500 mil. Note that the Avernic Defender in the picture is not included in this price, I just didn't have a spare Dragon Defender to use for this guide. So if you use a Dragon Defender, the setup will cost you right about the 500 mil. If you decide to upgrade to an Avernic, it'll be closer to 700 or 750 mil at current prices. Finally, we have a welfare setup. This cuts costs wherever possible from the previous cheaper setup, but it doesn't sacrifice a solid set of tribrid switches. At just over 50 mil, it should be very affordable for pretty much any high level player after a few hours of money making. If you can't quite afford this, you could also substitute in an Amulet of Fury for the Anguish and Torture, and the cost will drop to right about 30 mil. I wouldn't recommend that though because the Anguish and the Torture are very useful. Also, just like in the previous setup, the Avernic Defender is not included. I just didn't have a Dragon one to use for the purpose of this video. Now that we've gone over stats and gear, I'm going to explain the basics of the Theater of Blood. First, the location. It is located in the southeast corner of Mauritania, just east of Meyer Ditch. The best way to access it is to complete the A Taste of Hope quest and teleport directly in using Draken's Medallion, which you obtain from the quest. Otherwise, players can run through southern Meyerditch, or they can pay 10k coins to take a boat from near the Ectofuntus to the bay just north of the theater and run south. Next, the blood theme. This isn't too important for gameplay, but it's worth noting that inside the theater, 
There are several blood-based mechanics that deal damage to you or heal the bosses, or they can do both. Third, we have teamwork. Unlike the blood theme, this is extremely important. Because the theater is a piece of team content, you'll notice later on that many boss mechanics require good teamwork. This may sound daunting, but with a bit of practice, even a random group of players can work together to make it through. Team wipes are also an important concept. If your whole team dies during one boss fight, you are all ejected from the theater and must start over. You also have to pay 100k each to reclaim your gear from the chests located out in the lobby area. This can make learning the theater costly and frustrating at times, but the payoffs, both fun and profits, are very worth the struggle. Next we have the supply chest system. After the second and fourth bosses inside the theater, players have the chance to receive gifts from their vampire fans. Performing better, avoiding deaths and dealing lots of damage, awards players more points to spend on necessary supplies for the rest of the theater. Also, as of this video's creation, Iron Men can potentially farm rare potions like Staminas using this system. Be warned though, not participating in a boss room or dying in a majority of the rooms will result in no points being earned and the player who underperformed will only receive an onion from their chest and cannot purchase anything. Team size scaling is another important concept. Three to five players can enter the theater and bosses will be scaled depending on that number. Solos and duos can also enter the theater, but they do not receive special scaling and that would be extremely difficult for any one or two people to complete. A three man is much more difficult than a four man, which is more difficult than a five man. Beginners should look to join a five man team to avoid scaling raids harshly. At the time of this video's creation, experienced players often opt for four man teams, which are scaled only a little bit harder than five mans and are more rewarding per player. Now let's give a mention to team health orbs. After you enter the theater, you will see red orbs appear in the top left hand corner of your screen. There will be one for each player, in party order. The first letter of each player's name will appear on their corresponding orb, and you can mouse over to see their full name. As players take damage or heal up in the theater, the red color will proportionally drain from or fill their orbs, respectively. If a player dies, their orb will empty completely and simply be black until the room is cleared, upon which point it will refill. The orbs basically just serve as a helpful gauge to let you know how you and your party are doing at any time. Here we'll go over what happens between rooms. First of all, once a boss is dead and its death animation has completed, players will be rejuvenated. This effect restores health, prayer, and special attack up to full. Note that drain stats are not restored and boosted stats are not dropped though, so you'll still have to use a super restore if you're brewed down coming out of a room, although you do get to hold on to your boost if you're boosted coming out of a room, you won't need to repot for the next room. The other potential effect between rooms is a negative. If any player has not yet passed through the previous hallway to get into the current room, and another teammate starts that room, the player lagging behind will be kicked from the raid entirely. Make sure that everyone from your team has progressed before you start another room to avoid this. The theater also introduced a quality spectator system into the game. Players can spectate their friends, or any player with private chat set to on, for enjoyment or to learn more about the bosses and their mechanics. This can be very useful for new, for new players who want to see firsthand how the theater can be conquered, but don't want to risk spending 100k every time their team dies. The next point here is teleporting out. Regular teleports do not work. To teleport out, players must purchase a crystal from the mysterious stranger outside the theater for 75k cash. Because a team wipe only costs 100k, this is a feature that's not particularly useful for anyone but hardcore Iron Man. I would not recommend mains or even normal Iron Man waste their money on crystals because it only costs 25k more to die. Although you cannot teleport out of the theater, you can resign. If at any point players who are alive and not currently in a boss fight want to leave the theater, they can simply right click on a Vire Orator NPC and resign the raid at no charge. However, anyone fighting a boss does have to complete that boss before they are able to resign without penalty. Dead players must wait for their teammates to complete a room before they are allowed to resign. Finally, a little bit about logging out during the theater. 
If you log out between boss fights and your teammates do not start another fight or leave the current area, you can log back in without penalty. At least one team member does need to stay logged in though. This is a good way to reset your 6 hour logout timer if you forgot to before the raid and have been online for long enough to trigger it. If you log out during any boss fight though, even by disconnection, it will count as a death and you will be unable to participate in the rest of the fight. Death by logout works the same way as a regular death. You'll have to wait for your teammates to clear the room to get put back into the action. We will discuss the MVP system a little more later on when we cover rewards, but basically, the best performer, which from what we know right now is a combination of the least deaths and the most damage dealt, will receive the most points in supply chests and are also slightly more likely to receive a unique item in the treasure room at the end of the raid. Moving on, let's talk about some quick steps to get you started with your theater runs now that you know some of the basics. You may have noticed every gear setup included a salve amulet. This is a salve amulet E, a regular salve crystal that has been strung and enchanted using the diary from Tarn's Lair. It is not a salve amulet EI that has been imbued at the Nightmare Zone. The reason for this is that the only use for the salve in the theater is to kill the pestilent bloat boss, which is done using melee, and then the amulet is left on the ground afterwards in favor of more supplies. Because of this strategy, players should collect several inventories of enchanted salve amulets before they head into the theater. Next, we have getting on the Ancient Spellbook. You're going to want Ancients and a rune pouch full of water, death, and blood runes to use Ice Barrage. Ice Barrage is useful in several rooms and should be taken by every player in a team. Soul runes for Blood Barrage are also optional, although I recommend keeping waters, deaths, and bloods in your rune pouch as an inexperienced player, so you can always cast Ice Barrage when necessary without having to change weapon for a Kodai Wand if you brought one. Now for finding a team. Finding a team is one of the biggest hurdles players feel they need to overcome when starting out at the theater. For this, you have two main options. You can go with friends or clanmates, or you can go with random players in the free-for-all world, World 365. For the first option, don't be afraid to look at joining a casual PVM clan, or a more serious one if you're more inclined. There are lots of friendly people out there looking for other players to team up with for the theater. On the other hand, if clanning really isn't your thing, the Theater of Blood Lobby in World 365 is a place to group up with people who have similar levels of experience to yours. Playing with random teammates without voice communication can be difficult and frustrating sometimes, but it is still a great way to learn, and once you are more experienced, it's a great way to find teams if your friends or clanmates are offline. To start or join a team, just click on the bulletin board in the middle of the lobby. You'll be given the option to either make a party or click on existing parties and apply to them to be accepted. There are also a good number of experienced players like me out there who want to help new players learn the theater. I'll do my best to keep this video's description updated with all the learning resources that I'm aware of. There are a couple of Discord servers right now devoted to it, and new players are always welcome to come to my Twitch channel and watch and ask questions while I'm raiding. Also, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or in the YouTube comments here to ask any other questions you might have. Before you head into the theater, be sure to pre-pot. Eat an anglerfish and use a ranging and super combat potion. Boosted stats and HP aren't restored at any point during the theater, so this way you'll get to save a couple of supplies and make the first fight that much smoother. Now that you've got a team, you're ready to give the theater a go for the first time. Let's get started with an explanation of what to expect once you're inside. Your first opponent in the Theater of Blood will be the Maiden of Sugadinti. She is a mage-based blood boss that is especially weak to ranged. Because of this, you'll want to pray magic during the fight and use your best ranged weapon. This will be a twisted bow if you have one, because she has a high magic level. Otherwise, you can use a toxic blowpipe or the best crossbow you can afford. The Maiden has several unique mechanics you'll need to deal with during the fight, so let's get into a quick explanation of these with examples. As the fight starts, you'll want to hit the boss with your special attacks, preferably defense reducers like the Dragon Warhammer or the Bandos Godsword. Dragon Claws are also a decent option here. The Maiden attacks only the target standing closest to her, so you do not need to use Protect from Magic if someone else on your team is tanking. However, if you see your tank start to struggle, you should be ready to step in and pray mage and take over tanking. Now for the Maiden's first unique mechanic. 
When she reaches 70% hit points, as you see here, a set of Nilocus Matomenos will spawn. On spawn, the Nilocus walk towards the Maiden in an attempt to heal her. Any Nilocus that reaches the Maiden will explode and heal her for double its current HP. They have 100 max HP, so any undamaged Nilocus that reaches the Maiden will heal her for 200. Players should look to Ice Barrage every Nilocus spawn. Teams will usually assign a player to freeze a certain Nilocus to make sure everyone gets caught. Once they're frozen, kill them before they unfreeze and reach the Maiden. Blowpipe works best for this. There's also an added effect where each Nilocus that reaches the Maiden will make her attack stronger, so that just gives added incentive to kill them before they get there. Now I want to explain a little bit of an advanced mechanic here. As you can see, the Nilocus spawned 4 on the south, 4 on the north, and then there are 2 in the middle in the back row. If you time it properly, you can actually wait until the third and fourth rows converge together, as you can see here, and ice barrage them all in one big clump. This way you only have to blowpipe the first and second sets of Nilocus on the north and south, and then the third and fourth the tank can either blood barrage for healing, or the team can just ice barrage together to kill faster. This can be really useful because you just don't have to blowpipe individual Nilocus as much. And then once you've cleared most of the clump, you can switch back to the blowpipe to clear the rest. Here's an example of this strategy, along with the basic role assignments I mentioned earlier. The Nilocus spawn in four rows and are numbered accordingly. The closest two Nilocus to the boss are both number one, while the next closest two are number two. The third closest set of two are number three, and the four in the back are all number four. Players are assigned the roles I listed off to the left side of this picture, which give each player time to catch ice barrages on both of their assigned Nilocus. Make sure you've got these roles ironed out before you go into the room, because it's important that everyone knows what they should be doing. Now remember that all six Nilocus from rows 3 and 4 will converge and can be clumped together in the middle of the room, right around where I drew a red X. Players assigned to row 3 should wait until those two Nilocus are together to freeze them, then the players assigned to row 4 should wait until those four Nilocus are standing on top of the two from row 3. This allows for great blood barrage healing for the tank, or simply a very fast ice barrage clear for the whole team. There will be three waves of Nilocus during each Maiden fight, at 70%, 50%, and 30% HP. Always be ready to catch your freezes anytime you see your HP about to drop to those levels. Another unique mechanic at Maiden is the blood pool attack. Instead of making the normal swirling motion that accompanies her basic attacks, she will sometimes bend sideways and make a throwing motion. When this happens, blood will shoot at every tile a player is standing on, as well as a few random tiles. When the projectiles land, blood coats the ground on these tiles and causes every player on them to take rapid hit splats of damage. The Maiden is also healed for the same amount of damage any players take, and those players' prayer points will be drained. You can see this attack happen here coming up when she's at right around 24.4%. Right there you can see she bends sideways and throws the projectiles, so every player has to move to avoid the rapid damage and prayer drain. The blood pools also increase in potency, depending on how many Nilocus have made it through during the fight. So if you've let a lot through, they can hit over 30s and you should take extra care to dodge every single blood attack right away. Right before the end of the fight here, I've jumped to a quick pause to explain the last unique mechanic, blood spawns. Throughout the fight, Sometimes roaming red blobs called blood spawns will appear. They float around the room, leaving a trail of blood that players must avoid in their wake. These trails last several seconds and will eventually despawn. Here, you can see my character in the middle of the screen, and just to his northeast, there's a blood spawn, and just to my east and southeast, there's a trail that it's left behind. This blood trail has the same effect as the Maiden's blood pool attack. Standing in it will cause the player to take rapid damage and prayer drain. Blood spawns can generally be ignored as long as players can avoid the trails they leave behind. However, sometimes it's a good idea to freeze blood spawns and kill them with a blowpipe if there are too many to avoid with ease. At the time I'm making this guide, we don't know exactly what causes blood spawns to appear, but it seems to be connected to players being hit by blood pools or blood trails. Avoid these like you should be doing anyway, and you may find that you have fewer blood spawns to deal with during the fight. So once you've dealt with all these special mechanics and killed all the waves of Nilocus, hopefully your party has all survived and the Maiden will die, allowing you to leave the room. Here you can pick up any supplies you might have dropped to make room for switches, and you'll move on to the next boss, the Pestilent Bloat. 
The Pestilent Bloat is the second boss in the Theater of Blood. Because he's only 2000 HP and is very weak to melee, he is the fastest boss fight in the theater. However, he does also have one of the highest potentials of any boss to wipe your entire team. We'll get into that in a minute though. During the fight, you want to use your best melee weapon. Scythe and Tentacle Whip are best in slot here, and Grazi Rapier is also very good. Bloat's low defense level means you don't need defense reducing spec weapons, so you want to use your Dragon Claws or Crystal Halberd here for spec attacks. Bandos Godsword is also a decent option, but no more than one or two players in team should use in this room because you don't need to lower his defense very much. Bloat's attacks are mainly avoidable typeless damage. You want to pray range during the fight to block partial damage from his bloat fly attack because that's the only attack he uses directly on players. Now his mechanics are pretty punishing and they involve a lot of teamwork, so let's go ahead and move on to the fight and I can start to explain things. Upon approaching the room, you'll see Bloat walking around a large central vat of orange and yellow liquid. At least one player needs to enter the room to start the fight, but be sure that player only enters when Bloat is on the opposite side of the vat. Bloat's hitbox is a little wonky, and if his hitbox can see your hitbox at all when you enter the room, you'll take some damage from the boss's ranged Bloat fly attack, which can be pretty punishing. Once a player is entered, a 30 second timer starts. The player inside must stay out of Bloat's line of sight, always keeping the vat in between himself and the boss. Be careful because Bloat can randomly switch the direction he is moving in. Always try to stay in a position that gives you time to react if he does change direction while he walks. And there's an example of it right here. You can see that he changes direction on me and I have to just switch to make sure that he can't cast his Bloat fly attack at me. After 30 seconds have elapsed, the lights on Bloat's chest and back will flicker and go out and he will stop walking. At this point, the bloatflies will not attack, and any members of the team still waiting outside can enter the room. Everyone can now attack the boss without taking any damage. Bloat will stand still like this for 15 seconds, beginning from the exact moment he stopped moving. This is always enough time to get 5 whip hits or 4 scythe hits in, which is a good rule for beginners, and experienced players can often get 6 whip hits or 5 scythe hits in, using the proper timing. However, as you can see from what I did here, you have to be careful about greeting for extra hits. One of Bloat's unique attacks is what I call the Earthquake attack. Whenever he wakes back up after one of his 15 second pauses, he stomps the ground and makes the ground shake. Players holding a line of sight to him without the vat in between can take up to 80 damage from this attack, and it can't be prayed against, so make sure you avoid sticking around too long while Bloat is about to unfreeze. Now let's talk about the rest of Bloat's unique mechanics, which all go hand in hand because they occur during his movement phase. We have the falling hands and feet, the bloat flies, and how he can either walk or run. When bloat starts to move again after having stopped, shadows will appear on random tiles around the room, and after a short delay, a severed hand or foot will fall on those tiles. Players hit by a hand or foot will take up to 50 damage and be stunned for a short time. This makes them extra vulnerable to the next mechanic, bloat flies. Like I mentioned before, Bloat's fly attack will hit any players holding a direct line of sight to Bloat's hitbox while he's moving, and his hitbox is a little wonky so you have to make sure you stay on the complete other side of the vat to always avoid it. Being stunned in place by a hand or foot often means a player will take rapid Bloat fly hits for 10-20 to 20 damage, usually comboing them out before they can reach the safety of the vat. Bloat flies will also bounce to any teammates within a couple of squares of the targeted player, which is what really makes them dangerous. If multiple players make a mistake at the same time, every set of flies will bounce to every player in the area, making it possible for all of them to take a full health bar's worth of damage in just a couple of ticks. In this clip, you can see my teammate get stunned and hit by bloat flies as a result. Fortunately, he was in a pretty good position, so only one set of flies hit him and chained to me and another teammate, not dealing very much damage. It's very important to be aware of your position to keep from being killed, and maybe killing your whole team with flies as well. The last mechanic is Bloat's ability to walk or run. At the beginning of the fight, Bloat is always walking, which makes his attacks really easy to avoid. However, often when Bloat is between 60% and 20% HP, and at some other times, he will begin to run instead of walk. This requires players to move more quickly around the room to avoid his attacks, but if anyone overextends and Bloat switches direction right at that moment, 
the offending player will often be swarmed instantly by bloatflies. This is a really easy way to get your team wiped, so be sure you're always paying attention to whether bloat is walking or running, and always be ready for him to suddenly change direction. Finally, I want to give you all a little tip about maybe being able to avoid bloat's running attack entirely. If you only use your primary weapon and you don't spec the first phase after the first stop, you can often keep him above 60% HP so he will not start to run. Then, once he's stopped a second time, if you dump all your specs and deal as much damage as you can, you can often get him below 20%, which then sometimes skips the running phase completely, and then you can kill him during the third phase. This doesn't always work, but it's a pretty consistent way to save a ton of food and supplies. Once your team has killed Bloat, you can move on from the room. Here though, before you go through the hallway into the next room, on the right side you'll notice a supply chest like we talked about earlier. Any player who participated and did not die in at least one of the first two rooms will have earned some points with which they can purchase supplies, which could be anything ranging from staminas to brews to food in the form of sharks or sea turtles or manta rays. If you did all the rooms earlier right, you shouldn't really need to buy anything here. Sometimes I'll just pick up a stamina. This isn't a problem because any points that you don't use here will carry over to the chest that you'll see after the fourth room. Once you've figured out if you need some supplies, you can go through the door into the next room. Also, remember to drop your enchanted salve amulet here because you won't need it anymore. The next boss, the Nilocus, is a tower defense style room. Inside, there will be three different types of Nilocus. Iskaros, which are gray and can only be hit with melee attacks, Toxobolos, which are green and can only be hit with ranged attacks, and Hagios, which are blue and can only be hit with magic attacks. Each type of Nilocus only attacks with the same combat style that can damage it. There are also large Nilocus and small Nilocus. The large ones spawn two random small ones on death, so be ready to deal with the little guys whenever you do kill a big one. The best way to succeed in this room is to assign each player with one combat rule to target a specific color of Nilocus. In a five-man team, usually this means one player ranging with a blowpipe, while the other two players melee and two players mage. Simply attack any Nilocus that matches the color of your assigned combat style. Mages should use a trident or sanguinesti staff, but they can also often make good use of blood or ice barrage to quickly clear clumps of Nilocus hagios that gather at pillars or in the center of the room. So once players enter the room, Nilocus will begin to spill in from the west, east, and south sides. Some will attack players, but their main goal is to eat away at the four pillars supporting the room. If any pillar runs out of health, it will fall, and every player in the room will take around 35 damage. If all four pillars fall, the room is failed. Any remaining players are killed instantly, and the whole team wipes. A non-intuitive unique mechanic in this room is the Nilocus exploding from time to time. Basically, only a certain number of Nilocus can be in the room at once. If this cap is reached, but more Nilocus still need to spawn, some of them inside the room will explode to make room for the others to walk in. These explosions can deal over 20 damage each to nearby players. Comboed with a pillar falling, this is a very easy way to die. I'd recommend staying brewed up to 70 HP or higher if any pillars might fall or lots of Nilocus are about to explode. The final unique mechanic in this room is the Nilocus boss. After all the minions have been cleared from the pillars, a huge Nilocus will descend from the ceiling. It starts out as a melee, but it will randomly change to another color every two hits. You will have to change weapons and overhead prayers quickly to keep up. Be sure to always get your prayer right first. This boss can hit 70s on the wrong overhead, and even on the right overhead can hit over 20s. In addition to this, any incorrect combat style damage that the boss takes is reflected back at the player who deals it at 100% rate. Once the boss is dead, we can move on. The fourth boss in the theater is Sodaseg. Sodaseg is mainly a high defense magic boss, but he does have the ability to use all three combat styles. Twisted Bow is best against him, but players who do not own a Twisted Bow can also melee him pretty effectively with a tentacle whip. 
Sodaseg's basic attacks are red, magic-based projectiles that he shoots at one player. Upon hitting that player, the attacks can split and hit other players. The split projectiles will be either red and magic-based, like the original attack, or black and ranged-based. Set your overhead prayer accordingly if you see one coming at you. Missing a prayer and taking damage will forcibly disable your overhead prayer for a couple seconds, which can cause you to get comboed out by ensuing attacks which can hit up to 45 soft prayer. Even if you don't miss a prayer, do be careful because the magic attacks can still hit over 20s through prayer. The best way to deal with Sodaseg's basic attack set is to stand far enough apart so that the attacks do minimal bouncing between players. In a 5-man team, one player should stand close to the boss in the northwest with another player across the room in the northeast. One player should stand far to the southeast, and the other two players should stand on the far western wall of the room on the southwest side. When there is enough space between players in this setup, only the two players in the southwest will have to deal with attacks bouncing at all. If that didn't make a ton of sense, don't worry, I've drawn a little diagram here showing how your team should stand in the room. Player 3 can also be swapped with 4 and 5. It doesn't really matter which wall has one player next to it and which has two, it just matters that both sets of players are far enough south from player 1 and player 2, and far enough east and west from each other to keep the attacks from bouncing. When the fight starts, due to Sodaseg's high defense, players should hit a defense reducing special attack using Dragon Warhammer or Bandos Godsword. Only use one special attack each though, unless no one hits, because Sodaseg's defense will reset later, making holding on to several special attacks very important. After several normal attacks, Sodaseg will cast a powerful red ball attack at one player that causes a warning message to appear in that player's chat box. In a 5-man team, this attack will deal 115 damage and one-shot anyone it hits. However, this damage can be mitigated across the team. The attack deals decreased damage for every player standing within one square of its target when the ball lands. If all five team members share the attack, each player in the team only takes 14 damage. If four share it, each player only takes 21. The best way to get together to mitigate the exploding ball attack is to group up in the middle of the room just south of the boss. However, I would not recommend death dotting, which is everyone standing on top of each other in the same square. Sodaseg continues using his basic attacks during the ball phase, so any attack that were to hit death dotted players would give those it bounces to literally no time to react. This often leads to some team members' prayer being disabled and them getting stacked out and dying. Instead of DDing, players should spread out around the person who is tanking the ball attack. They can be right next to them, east, west, north, or south, or they can be one squared diagonal as well. I've drawn another little picture to give you an example of what I'm talking about. In a formation like this, players still have a little time to change prayers if they realize they have a ranged attack bouncing at them, and that can prevent them from having their prayer disabled and potentially getting comboed out, like I mentioned. The last unique aspect of Sodaseg is the Shadow Realm. At 66.6 and 33.3% health, Sodaseg will randomly choose a player to transport to the Shadow Realm, while all other players are teleported to the south end of the room, just south of the grid on the floor. Note that the beginning of the Shadow Realm phase cancels any attacks in the air, including the exploding ball. This can be very helpful in saving brews and allowing players to stay potted for the whole fight. The player in the Shadow Realm sees a red maze outlined on the grid north of them. That player must navigate the maze while taking small damage splats every few ticks. The players left behind in the normal boss room cannot see the maze that is highlighted in the Shadow Realm. They are shown only the square in the maze on which the player in the Shadow Realm is standing at any given time. For this reason, the player in the Shadow Realm should wait on the first two corners of their path, like I do here so the team can run over to the correct column, and here so they can see where the next step will be. The normal room players must quickly follow the path being outlined by their team member from the Shadow Realm. Stepping on any tile that isn't part of the correct path will cause rapid area of effect hits of around 20s to damage any players nearby. Do your best to avoid this, as it can quickly wipe everyone but your teammate in the Shadow Realm, and so to say it is nearly impossible to solo when scaled to a 5-man team. 
Once one player from the normal room reaches the fourth row of tiles, counting from the south side of the maze, a red tornado will start to chase the players along the path. It will hit any player within one square of it for two splats of at least 44 damage, generally killing that player instantly. It will then turn invisible and continue to chase the remaining players, so be sure not to slow down if a team member falls behind and dies, because the tornado will catch and kill you as well. Once the maze is complete, all players are returned to the normal boss room. When the grid changes back to its normal light gray color, the boss fight may be resumed. Do not step back on the grid before it changes color, because you'll still trigger rapid AoE damage and can easily die. Start out each new phase with defense reducing special attacks if you have any left. Sodaseg's defense is restored each time the Shadow Realm phase ends, so you'll need the special attacks to get it back down to a manageable level. From here, the fight is pretty standard. Just resume your positions from the diagram I showed you earlier, and be on the lookout for the exploding ball attack to know when you need to group up with your teammates. When Sodaseg is dead, you may leave the room and access the final supply chest of the raid. Here, you should replenish your supplies for the final battle with Lady Verzik. There is one more boss, Zarpus, before you get to the final challenge, but he is an easy fight and should not require any supplies. Going into Verzik, you will want at least three super restores. It will also be helpful to have a stamina potion, although most Verzik fights will require only a maximum of one stamina dose, so a lot of players will usually share. From there, you just want to get as many brews as you possibly can, and be sure you hold on to the boost potions that you should still have from the beginning of the raid. The fifth boss in the Theater of Blood is Zarpus. He is a poison-based boss that strictly uses typeless attacks, so overhead prayers have no use in this room. You'll find that Zarpus is pretty easy to hit with both ranged and melee, but the toxic blowpipe is best in slot here, so I'd recommend using that. You also won't want to be in melee range during the first part of the fight, but I'll get into that in a minute. Upon entering the room, players will see a faint green outline appear on one tile. That outline will turn into a greenish round shape with a black skeleton inside. These exhumed corpses appear periodically and heal Zarpus sixes for every tick that they're activated. Players must stand on the exhumed corpses as quickly as they possibly can once they appear to prevent this healing from happening. After a short time, the exhumed will disappear back into the ground and another will appear in a different location. Eventually, this will ramp up, so the number of exhumed on the ground will equal the number of players in your party, so ev everyone will have to actively participate in blocking the exhumed's healing attacks. It's okay if several of these do reach Zarpus, though. He'll simply take a little bit longer to fight once the exhumed phase ends, because he'll have higher health. After a while, exhumed will finally stop appearing, and the actual fight portion of Zarpus will begin. Players should start out by hitting Zarpus once he lifts off the ground, with their defense reducing special attacks from either their Dragon Warhammer or Bandos Godsword. Afterwards, they should back off and switch to Blowpipe and range gear to hit the boss. Zarpus will start to throw poisonous balls of miasma at the squares players are standing on. This works very similarly to the Maiden's Blood Pool attack that we talked about earlier in the video. The balls of miasma will land, forcing players to move, then leave a pool of miasma behind on the ground that will deal rapid poison damage to anyone standing on that tile. Unlike Maiden's attacks though, these pools remain on the ground until the very end of the fight. Do your best to stand by a far wall and keep the center of the room from getting too clogged up with tiles of miasma. Also, unlike at Maiden, Zarpus's miasma attacks only directly target one player at a time, hitting in a 3x3 square with the ball's landing point being the center. Be sure to step at least two tiles away from where you were previously standing when you're dodging Zarpus' attacks. Zarpus targets players sequentially based on the order of the raid party's organization. If you look at the health orbs in the top left hand corner of the screen, whoever is listed first will be targeted first. Whoever is listed second will be targeted second, and so on. The miasma attacks also have one side effect. Upon landing on the ground, each attack that comes directly from Zarpus will bounce to the square the next player in the party order is currently standing on. This means that players will almost always have to deal with multiple miasma balls at once. 
To handle this, I would recommend waiting for Zarpus to attack you to move. This will make the bounce attack target the square you're standing on from the player before you. Then the boss's direct attack will do the same. Then you can avoid both attacks at the same time by leaving that one square after both attacks have decided where to target. Finally, after the Miasma Ball phase, once Zarpus reaches around 25% HP, he will screech in chat and start to stare intently around the room. During this stage, attacking Zarpus while he is facing your direction will cause you to take massive damage, sometimes up to 90 in one hit. Zarpus will alternate randomly between staring northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast. I've drawn a little picture with an analogy. Think of it like a clock. When he's staring northwest, like in the picture, attacking the boss while standing in the 9 to 12 o'clock quadrant is not safe. Anywhere else in the room is safe. Something important to note here is that if you're standing directly in between two quadrants, that is, directly on the 12, 3, 6, or 9 o'clock lines, when, Var when Zarpus is facing either of those two quadrants, you will take damage. Make sure you're standing fully in a safe quadrant to avoid every attack. I recommend using a blowpipe during this phase as well, but it is a little bit difficult. Experienced players can get four blowpipe hits in every time Zarpus turns in a new direction, but if you're new, you may want to start with three just to be safe. After your three attacks once he's turned, you can just click on the ground and make sure that you don't attack him again until you know that he's not facing you. If you want to do this like some more experienced players, you should always be ready to move to the side that he's facing whenever he's about to turn. So if you can get your fourth hit in right before he turns and then be on the side that he was just looking at, you'll know that he has to turn to a different side and it'll be safe to attack from that previous quadrant. Whip is also pretty good during this phase. You have time for two hits, but again, you may just want to work your way up from one if you're going to use a whip here. In the video you can see me using a whip, although I've since changed to the blowpipe because it is better DPS, so I'd recommend you learn the blowpipe unless you're just an iron man who needs to save Zolra scales. Once Zarpus is dead, the miasma pools on the ground will dissipate and your team can move on to Lady Verzik. However, before you go into the next room, Make sure that someone on the team picks up the staff that the skeleton is holding on the north side of the room. This staff, which is called Dawnbringer, is instrumental in beating the first phase of Verzik, and without it, you will likely fail. So, here we are. The final challenge in the theater, Lady Verzik. She is a three-phase death trap with a slew of different attacks and mechanics that she'll use against you. She's also the only thing standing between you and a room full of treasure. Her first phase is very straightforward. When you enter the room, at the north end you will see Verzik sitting on a throne. There are also six pillars around the room for players to hide behind while they attack the boss. The fight will not start until a player talks to Lady Verzik and confirms that the team is ready. At this point, players usually elect to drop a few of their extra supplies, like brews and restores, so if they die at some point, their supplies won't completely go to waste, or if a teammate later on needs food and they don't, they can pick up some of the brews and restores scattered around the room. For the fight, Verzik's magic attacks during this phase are huge threats. If you're new, always keep your Protect from Magic Prayer up, because the magic attacks can hit 115's off prayer and cannot be tick eaten. Even with the correct prayer up, players can still take upwards of 60 damage per attack. The goal of this phase is to deplete Lady Verzik's shield and knock her off her throne. The shield's health bar will appear in blue in the top left hand corner of the screen. The best way to kill the shield is to use Dawnbringer, the staff your team took from the skeleton just after Zarpus. Its special attack, which requires 35% spec, can be used from range to hit up to 150s on Verzik's shield. Once players have run out of specs, they should drop the staff behind the safety of a pillar for another teammate to pick up and use. When everyone has used two specs, the player who went first should have regen back to 40%, and the cycle can be repeated with one spec for each player. When not using Dawnbringer, new players should probably wait behind the pillars as a team for their turn to spec Verzik. As you can see in the video, experienced players often speed this phase up by using attacks other than Dawnbringer's special, but in doing so they leave the safety of the pillars and open themselves up to making mistakes and taking hits from Verzik. Here's a quick look at how hiding behind the pillars works. 
Note there are several squares behind each pillar that do not protect players from Berserk's attacks, even though they look like they should. Stand in one of the green squares to avoid being hit, and again, I'd recommend that new players keep protect from magic up at all times anyway, just to be safe. To take things very slow if you're new, your team could just hide behind the pillars together in order from 1 to 6 while waiting for everyone's special attacks to regenerate. Other teams may speed things up and agree on a different order, but just be sure that you know what your team plans to do before you go into the fight. Any pillar players are hiding behind will be targeted by Verzix attacks. The pillars have health bars, which will be depleted after 4 or 5 hits from Verzix. Players must move away from pillars as they run out of HP, because standing next to one when it falls will result in taking over 60 damage and being pushed aside for a moment. This can sometimes allow Verzix enough time to hit you on top of the 60 stack and combo you out. Once everyone in the team has gone through a few cycles of special attacks, you should have done enough damage to take down Verzik's shield, and the second phase will start as she jumps off her throne. At the start of the second phase, Verzik will float into the center of the room and become targetable again. Players should switch into their melee gear and pray ranged. This stage is also doable with a twisted bow or a blowpipe, but melee is so much better that I want to only teach you all this method. While it is a bit harder to learn, the increased difficulty now will pay huge dividends as you get better. Once Verzik reaches her spot in the middle of the room, she will remain in place and begin throwing out white and purple bomb attacks. These are ranged based attacks that target the squares players are standing on, hitting in the 40s off prayer and in the high teens on prayer. Every once in a while, the attack will happen as always, but the bombs will fly much slower than usual. Just watch out for this and always be sure not to stand on the targeted tile no matter how fast or slow the bombs are moving. During the second phase, Verzik also gains a new type of attack. If players are standing on a square adjacent to the boss when she goes to attack, they will be bounced away and stunned in place for a short time. Running under Verzik has the same effect, but will also deal over 60 damage and trigger the message, there's nothing under there for you. If this attack happens and you get stunned, you are stuck in place while the next bomb attack hits you. It's very important to avoid for this reason. One bad cycle can deal over 80 damage to you even if you have protect from range active. So the goal here with the melee method is to start by standing one square away from Verzik. Right when she attacks, you want to click on her. Because you're meleeing, this pulls you out of the square her bomb will target. After you walk closer and get a hit in, but before her next attack, you should click back to one square away to prevent Verzik from hitting you with her bounce attack. Here's another quick tip about meleeing. It's a good idea to click away on a different square than the one you were just on before you attacked. This is a consistent way to dodge Verzik's bomb attacks without having to click with perfect timing. You can see me doing this in the clip. I'm walking in a sort of triangle motion instead of just back and forth, and this always moves me out of the square the last bomb targeted. Verzik hits on a 4 tick cycle during this phase, so with a tentacle whip, which is a 4 tick weapon, you can get one hit in every time Verzik attacks, and you can continue meleeing in a nice repetitive cycle. If you're using a scythe, which is a 5 tick weapon, you'll have to stall a couple of your hits to make sure you don't get bounced. After a few attacks, Lady Verzik will shoot a purple projectile at one location near her, and 1 to 5 Nilocus will spawn around the room. These Nilocus will target players, walking towards them and exploding for massive damage if they get too close. Players can avoid this attack entirely by using ice spells to freeze the Nilocus in place right after they spawn. Eventually, after they've been frozen but before the freeze timer ends, they'll explode harmlessly away from players. The purple projectile, on the other hand, will turn into a Nilocus Athanatos, which will periodically heal Verzik for around 10 hit points. Players must attack it with a poison or venom inflicting attack, so either with the tentacle whip or the blowpipe. This will cause the Nilocus to, instead of healing the boss, hit the boss for around a 70 in poison damage, and then it will despawn. Also, do be careful not to be standing underneath where the Nilocus Athanato spawns, because you will take some damage. This Nilocus attack usually happens twice per second phase of Verzik, but it may happen more than twice if the phase goes really slowly. Just watch for the purple projectile and you'll always be ready to catch freezes when the Nilocus do spawn. The last unique attack of this phase is Verzik's electricity attack. 
From time to time, she will launch out a bluish ball of electricity that will jump between players. After four bounces that deal 4-7 to seven damage each, the fifth hit will deal between 45 and 50 damage to that player. However, if the ball passes through Verzik at any point before it hits its fifth target, it will disappear and deal no further damage. If your team is doing the melee method on this phase and standing close to Verzik as a result, you don't really have to worry about this attack. Most of the time it will be blocked without any extra effort on your part. In the past, a lot of players chose to bring insulated boots, which do actually have the damage from this attack, but if you deal with it correctly, it's not worth the extra inventory space, so I wouldn't worry about them. Once Verzik drops to 35% HP on her second phase, she will stop attacking for a short time, and a blue channel will appear around her. If you attack her during this channel, you will heal her instead of damaging her. Once the channel ends, Verzik will switch to a blood magic attack that drains prayer and heals her. You should switch her overhead to protect from magic instead of ranged here to block this damage. However, your prayer will still be drained. Also, Versic can still use her bomb attack during this phase, so with protect from magic up you have to be extra careful to dodge it, or you'll take at least 40s every time you're hit. In addition to this, two Nilocus Matomenos similar to those at Maiden will spawn while Versic channels. Players should kill these while Verzik is invulnerable because after a short time, they'll despawn and heal her for double their current HP. Once the Nilocus are dead, players can return to attacking the boss. This healing and channel attack will happen periodically for the rest of the fight until Verzik reaches 0% HP on her second phase. Once that happens, she'll turn into a spider and the third phase will begin. The final spider form of Verzik has several new special attacks and, at least as of this video's creation, deals brutal amounts of unblockable damage. Players should melee her, as she is still weak to slash, and pray against her attacks as best as possible. She attacks with magic and ranged like Ulm does from raids 1, switching between the two styles without warning. If she lights up blue underneath and shoots blue orbs at players, pray magic. If she uses a stomp animation and shoots green spikes, Pray ranged. The first thing we're going to talk about is Verzik's powerful area of effect melee attack. When the fight starts, Verzik will choose one player to target as the primary tank. In this clip, you can see that she's decided to target me. Her first attack's combat style will always be ranged or magic. After that though, if the tank is within melee distance, she gains the ability to use her powerful melee attack. When meleeing, she can hit over 60s on everyone in melee range at the same time instead of her usual max of around 38 with ranged or magic. To prevent this, the tank should either run away from or step underneath the boss whenever she's about to attack. Versic hits on a 7 tick cycle, which means that sometimes the tank will have to skip their second whip hit to get out of melee range. Avoiding Versic's AoE melee attacks while allowing the team to melee her is key to having a quick and successful third phase fight. Now let's talk a little bit about Lady Versic's special attacks. She has four of them, which she uses in a cycle. Summon Nilocus, Webs, Yellow Spots, and Green Bomb. Beginning at the start of the final phase, every five attacks, Versic will use a special attack. Players should count her basic attacks to know when to expect a special. The first attack is summoning several Nilocus. This works similarly to the Nilocus summon from phase two, but there is no Athanatos to heal her. Just freeze the Nilocus in place when they spawn, then avoid their explosion radius while you continue to damage Verzik. The next special is the web mini phase. Five attacks after the Nilocus were summoned, Verzik will briefly become untargetable and move to the center of the room. From there, she will swivel around and throw green webs towards players. The webs land on the ground and any player caught in one will be frozen in place and rendered unable to move or attack. After a short delay, the web will explode and deal over 50 damage to that player. Players caught in webs can be freed though. Their teammates should attack the web underneath them, usually with ranged or ice barrage. If the web is killed before it explodes, the trapped player is freed and takes no damage. If the web is at least damaged partially before exploding, the player will take reduced damage. Despite melee being best for Verzik at all times, I recommend new players especially use range during this phase. Players meleeing have to hit on a difficult 5 tick cycle, and it's very hard to avoid webs while you're in melee range. Verzik also seems to have reduced defense during web phase, 
so range seems to be more effective here than it would be during the rest of the fight. Rangers are also a little more helpful in freeing trapped teammates. After five more attacks, Verzik will become untargetable again. Her back will sprout open and yellow spots will appear on the ground around the room, one for each player. Players must quickly run onto a yellow spot before the yellow projectiles shot out of Verzik's back fall from the sky onto them. Anyone who fails to reach a yellow spot will take nearly 70 damage. Note that players cannot share a spot. Everyone must take their own individually. Any two players caught on the same spot when the attack hits will both take damage as if neither were protected. The final attack in Verzik's arsenal of specials is the green bomb attack. Five hits after yellows, Verzik will shoot a green bomb at a random player. The bomb will explode on contact for 74 damage. If a team wants, the bomb can be bounced between players to reduce that damage. Standing on an adjacent square to the player targeted by the green bomb will make the bomb bounce to that player. Two more teammates must then do this. The ball must bounce between four unique players to be mitigated. Remember this is four unique players. Unless the team is smaller than four, the same person cannot tank two bomb hits. If this is done correctly, everyone will only take 5 to 10 damage and the ball will disappear after the last bounce. Most teams usually just elect to tank this bomb instead of bouncing it because it's simpler and only deals around 40 more total damage than going to the whole effort of bouncing it around the team. This special attack cycle will continue throughout the rest of the fight, all the way until Verzik falls to 0 HP. Verzik has two final mechanics to discuss, the purple tornadoes and an attack speed change. When Verzik drops to 20% hit points, she spawns purple tornadoes, one for each player. The tornadoes chase players around the room at around walking speed, and each one can only hit the unique player that it is targeting. If a player is hit by a tornado, they will take 50% of their current HP and damage, and Verzik will heal for, heal for about 5% of her max health. Remember that during the purple phase, Verzik's special attack cycle still continues. Web phase is especially dangerous during purples, because getting caught by a web is almost guaranteed to cause that player to get purpled and heal the boss. Also, the yellow attack is much harder to handle. Players must first run away from their spot to draw the purple away, then jump on the spot at the perfect moment to avoid damage without getting purpled. If you have plenty of supplies and you're completely new to this, you might want to just tank the yellow hit on your first few runs until you get the hang of this method. Finally, at 20% when the purple tornadoes spawn, Verzik's attacks also speed up. She hits every 5 ticks instead of every 7, dealing damage more frequently and accelerating the special attack cycle. This can exacerbate some weird interactions. Namely, her AoE melee attack registers while a player is close by, but hits once they've already run away. This can give the appearance that you've been meleeed from 6 or 7 squares away, when really you were right next to her when the attack actually registered. If your meleeing is the tank during this stage, just watch Verzik's attacks. You should attack her every time you see her attack. At that point, you'll have at least 4 ticks to get in, then get back out of melee range safely. From there, all you have to do is repeat the process. Just always make sure you're not standing adjacent to her one tick before her attack animation goes off. I actually didn't do a very good job of this in the clip. You can see that I got meleeed because I was attacking more in sync with her cycle instead of one tick off of it. Even as an experienced player, it's easy to kind of lose your cool during this phase and just try to rush through. So as a beginner, you may just want to avoid being in melee range at all. It's not a bad option to throw on your range gear and kite away from the boss instead. Once you've done a few successful runs and have a good feel for Verzik and her mechanics, you can go back and learn to tank the purple phase as a meleeer. When Verzik finally drops to 0 HP, she turns into a bat and flies away. A tunnel opens up under the throne, leaving the path to her vault clear. Upon entry, players can stop by the table to the west and check out some stats about the raid, like who was the most valuable player, how much each player died, and how long each room took. Just north of that, there is a chest for each player. Big golden arrows appear over each monumental chest to denote which belongs to which player. If one of the chests is decorated with a purple trim, that player received a unique item. No more than one unique item can be dropped per raid, and then it's decided who gets it from there. Opening the chest will trigger a loot broadcast for the whole team, letting them know which unique was dropped. There is also a little Zik pet, a miniature of Verzik's spider form. 
It can be dropped at any time upon a player opening their chest. Unlike with Omelette in the Chambers of Zarek, a unique drop is not required for a player to receive the little Zek pet, although you can get it along with a unique drop. Finally, after a successful run, once you've withdrawn or banked your loot, you can go to the southeast corner of the area. There, there's a little teleporter on a pedestal that will take you out of the Theater of Blood. You'll get the message, you fought well, and it's also worth noting that whoever leaves first will be the new party leader. So that's it guys. I'm not going to go too crazy talking about any of the drops because we still haven't heard anything from Jagex about the drop rates for any of the uniques. All that feels safe to say right now really is that the Avernic Defender Hilt is the most common item, followed by Justicier Armor, followed by what seems like a mega rare tier made up of Sanguine SD Staff, Grazi Rapier, and Scythe of Vitur. At the end of the video here, I'm just going to leave you guys with a quick look at the loot I've made from the Theater of Blood. I've got 200 KC so far, and if you want to check out a little more detailed version of this, feel free to look in the description for a link to my 100 hours of Theater of Blood video. Also, special thanks to the players I free for alled with to get the clips for this video, and to Charles for helping me make sure I didn't miss anything important. Other than that, thank you very much for watching, and I hope this helped you learn a little bit more about the Theater of Blood. It's an incredible piece of content, and I look forward to seeing more players giving it a try.